Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on greenhouse gas emissions associated with dairy farming systems presented by Tom Richards and Gustavo Camargo of Penn State University. This is the third webinar in our climate change webinar series that we've been running since last fall. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our recorded webinars, information about upcoming webinars, as well as articles and videos on organic farming on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We're very pleased to introduce Tom Richard and Gustavo Camargo this afternoon. Tom is the director of Penn State's Institute for Energy and the Environment, He's also an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering. His primary research focus is the development of sustainable strategies for biomass feedstock supply. Gustavo Camargo is a PhD student in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering at Penn State. His research focuses on energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in crop and livestock agroecosystems. He has consulted on these topics for both the private sector and the USDA. After their 45-minute presentations, you'll have the chance to ask them questions. If you have a question, you can simply type it into the question box on your screen and hit return. If you don't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. We'll read the questions out loud and we'll answer as many as we have time for in the 30-minute question period following the presentation. Well, now I'm going to switch the screen over to Tom Richard. Hello, everyone, and welcome. So I'm going to be talking today, uh, and Gustavo and I, about a number of different uh, whole farm modeling approaches to understanding the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions on dairies. And um, these are, well the, well, the results I'll share are model results. They're actually informed by experimental work. Um, we've been working quite a bit with Al Rotz, who's with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service in their Pasture Systems and Watershed Management Research Unit, which is located here in State College, Pennsylvania. And uh, Al has been working for many years on uh, a model that's called the Integrated Farming Systems Model, which uh, we'll share some results from. Um, Muted. On our credit, uh, Dawn Chianovis, who, uh, when she was a, a PhD student here, uh, integrated greenhouse gas algorithms into that integrated farming systems model and we'll share some of her results as well. I want to start by uh, sharing a little bit of background about greenhouse gases and just, uh, there we go, um, their implications. And this is a slide which many of you will have seen before. Um, it's projections by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and illustrates uh, both what the uh, variations in the Earth's, temp Earth's temperature have been like for the last thousand years, including the last hundred, which is uh, illustrated in the, the far right part of the solid red line, and then projections for the next hundred years. And there are, of course, many different models, and all of them have uncertainties. Those are illustrated in the colored bars to the right of the screen. But most of them indicate that it's on the trajectories that our society is on, we're going to see increases of uh, temperature on the order of 2 degrees uh, Celsius in this century. And some of the estimates are up to over 5 degrees Celsius. Um, those are global averages. And the impacts will be quite different in different localities. Um, when we look at the impacts on people, uh, these are some of the estimates of impacts in terms of water shortages, uh, risks of malaria and other infectious diseases, <clears throat> hunger, and coastal flooding. And these are projecting out to the 2080s, so 70 years from now. And, and they're a function of temperature. And you see that uh, average estimate of a 2 degree global temperature rise um, is right at the inflection point for some very major impacts uh, on human society. And of course, when we see risk of water sh shortage, that'll affect agriculture. Um, those impacts will be distributed broadly across uh, the planet. And here in Pennsylvania, uh, things actually don't look too desperate. Our rainfall will, it will become more erratic and less predictable. Um, 
will still be roughly constant, at least that's what most of the models project. Uh, although temperature will be warmer uh, this time of the year, that's not necessarily a big problem here. But there are other places where the impacts will be quite seriously negative, and um, we want to try to mitigate that as much as possible and also adapt to it. Uh, the talk today will be focused primarily on what the mitigation opportunities are, how we can reduce the impacts on greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. And I want to start that part of the conversation by just sharing it with you what the distribution of greenhouse gas emissions are uh, across various industrial sectors, uh, different end uses or activities, and also the gases themselves. So those are the three vertical pieces of this mass flow diagram. And you can see that the uh, red and orange on the left are the pieces of the puzzle that we usually think about when we think about human impacts on uh, climate change. There are uh, different types of energy uses in our society. And most of those energy uses end up uh, resulting in significant amounts of carbon dioxide, uh, particularly as fossil fuels are burned. But I also want to direct your attention to the green and purple bars lower on the slide. Uh, the green bar illustrating the impact of land use change, particularly deforestation, but also somewhat mitigated by afforestation and reforestation. Um, also harvest and, and soil management, uh, which uh, through intensive cultivation can uh, release some of the soil carbon into the atmosphere. The purple bar is agriculture, and uh, globally that's about a little over 13% of our global warming activity, uh, split fairly evenly between agricultural crop production and livestock and manure management. Um, interestingly, if you look at the gases over on the right, the agricultural soil impact is primarily resulting in nitrous oxide emissions. That's uh, a result of fertilizers and denitrification producing uh, nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, over 300 times as uh, much impact per kilogram as carbon dioxide. And then with livestock and manure, uh, most of the impact is methane, which is uh, also a, a potent greenhouse gas, not the same 300 times multiplier, but something around 20 times the impact per kilogram of carbon dioxide. Uh, and that's projected over the next 100 years. So interestingly, the agricultural impacts are on these two, what are otherwise minor greenhouse gases, but they're very major in terms of, of uh, our industry's impact, uh, methane from, from livestock and manure, and nitrous oxide from agricultural soils. That's the global picture. Here in the US, the, uh, the pie chart looks quite a bit different. Uh, we don't have a lot of deforestation going on here. In fact, we've got a lot of afforestation as abandoned land goes back into succession and many times into forests. Um, our agricultural uh, system is a smaller part of our overall portfolio, um, and the total impacts uh, are about 6%. But again, you'll see that that's mostly in the forms of methane and nitrous oxide. If you look... Uh, at, at the reason for those discrepancies, it really has to do with our overall uh, consumption. And this is an illustration of the, uh, the relationship between gross domestic product per capita, which is on the horizontal axis, and carbon emissions per capita, which are on the vertical axis. Uh, these are log-log scales, uh, so there are really huge discrepancies in terms of the carbon emissions per capita and the wealth per capita uh, for individual countries. And the upper of the two lines here is the, the um, regression through the entire uh, set of countries on the globe, and many of them are spelled out here. Uh, you see the United States is up in the uh, far upper right um, and very close to that line. Well, you also see a, a second line that's the, uh, the intensity that runs through uh, the Congo and the Switzerland. And, and obviously the countries down in the bottom left have very low carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also very little wealth. That's not a place that we want to replicate. Uh, but there are quite a few countries in the upper right that have got very different impacts, uh, and some of them are wealthier than us. Uh, Switzerland is one example, but uh, uh, Germany, um, France, UK, the Netherlands all have significantly uh, lower greenhouse gas impacts per capita than we have and comparable wealth. 
So I, I wanted to get start out by getting away from the idea that, that some of these mitigation strategies are necessarily negative. In fact, what we hope to uh, describe by the end of the, the webinar is that, in fact, many of the things that uh, we think can have positive impacts in terms of climate change and agriculture also have other kinds of benefits, uh, sometimes economic, sometimes other ecosystem services, sometimes uh, lifestyle, et cetera. To delve down into the science a bit further, um, when we look at the, the overall greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, um, there are uh, a number of different subsectors. I mentioned earlier the soils and nitrous oxide. That's primarily through uh, fertilizer systems. And nitrous oxide is produced uh, during denitrification when uh, nitrate, which is a very common and very effective fertilizer, uh, is anaerobic and uh, starts to denitrify towards nitrous oxide, but it goes, excuse me, towards nitrogen gas, which is 80% of the atmosphere we're breathing and is inert, so that's not a problem in and of itself. But on the way from nitrates to, to nitrogen gas, uh, the molecule goes through the nitrous oxide phase, and because that's a gas, it, it can escape there. And that is about 40% of the overall greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Um, so wetland systems are particularly uh, high impact there because of the, the uh, potential for denitrification under anaerobic conditions, but there also needs to be nitrate there, and that can come from anaerobic systems. Uh, that same mechanism is what you see in the rice bar in the orange, and um, also part of the manure management uh, component because there is some denitrification that can happen there, although the primary impact there is methane. Um, Methane is also the primary impact in, uh, in rice and, and also in enteric fermentation. Uh, enteric fermentation is basically the digestion uh, in animals, uh, particularly in ruminant am animals where they have a, a small anaerobic digester in their gut and are producing methane, which is largely emitted back out their, their mouths uh, through various uh, belching, et cetera. Uh, there's a distribution of those gases, again, primarily dominated by nitrous oxide and methane. Here's another mass flow diagram. This is of uh, the food system in the United States. And it was uh, developed by Heller and Keolian, Greg Keolian at the University of Michigan, who runs a sustainability program there that has a number of different things that are of, of uh, broad interest in terms of the impacts of, of various activities that we partake in. Uh, this was work done about, two th in about 10 years ago, so the numbers aren't entirely up to date, but they haven't changed dramatically. And um, what I want to draw to your attention to here is a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, the overall food system includes a lot of inputs, uh, both uh, crops and also forages over on the left side. And then the outputs, which are uh, useful outputs, including exports, particularly grain, to other parts of the world that need them and also our edible food supply. But along the way, there are many, many losses. And one of the messages that I wanted to relate here is that those losses uh, are not only a, a oftentimes a waste of energy, but also a, a waste of uh, important food value, but also have greenhouse gas impacts. So, um, so those are pieces to pay good attention to. Um, I also wanted to note, since we're going to focus on dairy systems today, um, how much of the inputs to dairy systems end up being uh, released as animal respiration, animal waste, and um, of course uh, the animals themselves. And uh, some of those uh, byproducts are in the bottom right there, uh, the, the big part of that feed bar to livestock and poultry. It's roughly 800 million tons a year that goes into the U.S. food system. Uh, we get about 200 million a little under uh, 200 million tons out of that in terms of food. So there's uh, roughly 75% that's lost on that path. And those losses are opportunities for us to find more sustainable paths in that system. One of the, uh, what we're going to do now is shift gears a little bit to look at some of the specific opportunities that we can see in, first of all, cropping systems and then in overall livestock systems. So I wanted to introduce this uh, concept of one, one opportunity that uh, we're going to look at closely 
and that I'm particularly excited about because it's an opportunity that I think has implications both for better managing our dairy systems, but also for finding other ways to um, extract value from agricultural land while enhancing ecosystem services. So we're going to talk about winter crops as, uh, as uh, not just cover crops, but as added value crops. And first of all, I wanted to illustrate the example of when we have an annual crop without a cover crop. And this, this figure and much of the early work in this area um, was done by Andy Hegensteller, who was a PhD student at Iowa State University. We overlapped when I was there earlier in my career and is now with the Midwest Research Institute. And um, he did some work on triticale and integrating that into some Midwest farming systems. But anyway, the, the point of this first figure is that uh, in our typical annual cropping systems, we have a period in the spring and also in the fall when there is a lost opportunity for ca capturing sunlight and growing crops, uh, but there's also a negative impact in terms of nitrogen le leaching from the systems during that time period. And when we look at uh, ways to enhance the energy efficiency and reduce the greenhouse gas impacts of farms, uh, capturing that winter window and the sunlight and the opportunity for crop growth during that window, window turns out to be a very interesting opportunity. So here's a, a similar illustration again by Andy Eggensteller uh, looking at the introduction of a cover crop. Uh, typically it would be planted in the uh, fall, uh, germinate, uh, cover the ground and begin to soak up some nutrients in the, in the fall and winter and then uh, burst into uh, rapid growth in the spring again, capturing some of that sunlight and uh, nutrients that otherwise would leach through the soils. Uh, so I think we're, we're all pretty familiar with some of the, the environmental benefits of those cover crops, but we wanted to share with you some of the energy and greenhouse benefits as, at all, as, with those as, as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Gustavo now and have him walk you through some of his analysis on how these double crops can be introduced into dairy farming systems. Hello everyone, Gustavo here speaking. So I will talk about two of the three strategies we are saying today. So I'll first start with what we call the cropping systems, so the use of double crops that was introduced by Tom. And then I'll go further with some dairy management practices that could be done and how that impact the greenhouse gas emissions. And then Tom will go from there comparing organic versus conventional dairy systems. So for those three strategies, we use two modeling tools. For the cropping systems, we will use one tool developed by us called the Farm Manager Analysis Tool, FEET. And for the dairy management practices in the organic versus conventional dairy, we use the USDA model developed by Al Rotz called the Integrated Farm Systems Model, IFSM. So I'll explain first the cropping system strategy. So this is the scenario we have a dairy farm with 160 cows, dairy herd, no-till, and 154 hectares in Center County, Pennsylvania. So we're comparing just the two cropping systems. So the first current cropping system, it is a corn silage with corn grain, soybean, and alfalfa rotation. And then the comparison double cropping system, we double crop rice silage with corn silage as the winter crop and harvest that. So this is a double cropping. Plus, we also add rice silage together double cropped with soybeans. So going to the energy results, actually before that, we set the milk production for the current and the double crop the same. So as we can see here, we have the same milk production. And because of the fact we have double cropping in this one, we have a higher feed production. So what we decided in this scenario here that we're going to be doing with this excess feed is production of biofuels. So the excess biomass will be converted to fuel, so then we can see that we have an excess 400 liters per hectare in this imaginary farm that we generated here. So if we convert this to energy, we can go to the next graph. Uh, 
and then you'll see the inputs which are described here in your right side for the conventional and for the double cropping systems. So you can see the impact of fuel and the nutrients. I'd like to mention here also that manure was applied on those fuels, so that's why there's no need for or fuel need for nitrogen nutrient. So we needed this amount of inputs for the particular cropping systems and to feed the cows, and the cows produced this amount of milk. In the double cropping system, we need a higher amount of inputs because of the added rye crop, but plus with that we got also the same amount of milk as we can see in orange, plus ethanol that could be produced in some biodiesel. So this was the concept we developed with this farm energy analysis tool model feat. So then when we shift to greenhouse gases, we have a a graph that accounts for the greenhouse gas for the crop production and then the, the carbon that was assimilated in the plant material, so in other words the CO2 used in the phot photosynthesis to assimilate that carbon so we take into account that as a negative carbon here in the graph so as the other graph also a higher emission for the double crop but also a higher assimilation for the double crop. The emissions from the dairy, so the respiration and the methane and plus the manure emitted greenhouse gas are accounted in this bar here which are described here. So we have livestock housing, manure storage and also the manure emitted once it's applied in the manure NTO. And then if we add the input plus or minus the crop assimilation and the livestock manure emission, we get a net emissions for the current and the double cropping. So with this strategy of double crop, we could see that we reduced the carbon footprint by this amount. So going next to the other strategy, so this scenario, we used the model IFSM, and then we, we generated a typical Pennsylvania farm with alfalfa, grass, and corn in a medium clean some soil with 100 hectares and 100 cows plus 38 heifers under one year and 42 heifers under one year and over, and with a milk target production of 10,000 kilograms and a freestall barn in a manure removal daily and biannual application. And here were the comparisons. So we compared tillage systems, forage, grain ratio, manure storage, and BST implementation, how that impact the cows. The confinement and pasture will be covered later on Tom further comparison with organic and conventional dairy. So going next to the first comparison, so we have conventional tillage, conser conservational tillage, and no-till. So what we can see from this graph, tillage can affect three in three ways greenhouse gases. The first one is the soil disruption. So if you have conventional till, mobard plowing, we, we make the soil organic matter more available to be decomposed, and this allows higher CO2 production. But on the other hand, you can argue that in reduced tillage, there's a lower residue incorporation that could also be accounted as carbon sequestration in that residue. So there's, there's two sides of, of tillages. Plus, the second thing that could affect is erosion. So we have conventional to a higher erosion, so this could create an indirect emission, so this soil might go out of the boundary and emit this carbon from this eroded soil. And finally, the N2O emissions from tillage. Right now, the science is not quite defined if reducing tillage or medium tillage would impact the N2O emissions. Some suggest that reducing tillage is the, is the, is the method to control N2O emissions, but there are some studies reporting that reduced tillage 
performed better than no-till. So it's still not very certain in the literature. So what we can see here that for the conventional tool, there was a higher combustion of CO2, so that's why the higher CO2 bar. And we got the same levels of methane emissions, and the N2 emissions varied. So more or less similar greenhouse gas emissions. So if we go to the next comparison, which is the ratio between forages. So we have low forage to grain ratio, high with the forage purchased, and high with the forage produced on farm. So one first thing to mention here, the higher the forage content, the higher is the methane. So if we compare the low forage ratio with the high, we can see the methane produ production gets higher. So in total numbers, it increased 16%. So then when we look the two comparison between high forage grain ratio compared the purchased against produced, there's a difference in, in the methane emissions. And this is due to the type of forage in each of the systems. In the middle one right here, we have high quality alfalfa, so this emits more than this one here. This forage is corn silage. So that's why the, the two bars are different. There's also an impact in the CO2 of the systems. Going to the next comparison, that is the hormone usage, the BST that's supposed to increase the milk production for BST. So once you increase the milk production, you will need more feed. And once you feed more, you produce more greenhouse gases off the total farm emissions. So I'd like to mention, I didn't mention before, the axis here is total greenhouse gas emissions of the farm. So the total emissions here are higher than no BST. And, and again, this is due to the higher rate of feeding. But if we normalize in terms of milk produced, we can see that the no BST was a little bit higher than BST. One factor that it's not accounting here, and it's showing now in the literature, is the fact that once BST is applied on cows, the, the, they don't last as long, their lifetime. So what the farmer need to do is to increase the number of heifers. So this might impact of the number, the amount of feed for the, those heifers. So this number might go up more if you would take into account this factor. So the last comparison is in terms of manure storage. We have three options here. Manure storage with no cover, manure storage with curve, cover and surface application, and manure storage with cover and injection. So we could see that no cover had higher emission. Why is that? Because when you cover your manure application, what is happening here, you're capturing that methane and then you're flaring, so you're converting methane to CO2 and as methane is a higher greenhouse gas potential, it reduces the total greenhouse gas CO2 equivalent. So that is why it goes from 442 to 362. So this reduction goes 14 percent. Now when we compare the two covered manure and different manure applications, we could see a trade-off here. So what happened, once you inject the manure, you increase the NTO emissions. So what happened here, you move from 177 to 213, so there's an increase of, of N2O. So in final words, it's pretty much the same trade-off that's going on between the surface application and the injection. So with that,
I'll pass back to Tom and then he'll talk about the comparisons between the conventional and the organic dairy. Thanks, Gustavo. So um, I wanted to then go through a, yet another case study, and we've got a, a few more to go here. Um, and, and I wanted to reinforce that each one of these is uh, case studies. We're sharing with you modeling results, but they have been validated. This particular uh, validation exercise was done on a farm in New York State. Um, and it was one that there was a, a, a fairly complete greenhouse gas inventory done as part of a, um, an overall gas emission study that the federal government uh, um, funded across, uh, well, many different livestock sectors, but including dairies. Um, this is not an organic farm. Now, uh, I am going to get to a comparison of dairy farms in a few minutes, but we wanted to use this illustration to look at uh, different manure management handling systems. And so in this case, uh, the, we're going to look at uh, the impact of anaerobic digesters. This is a, obviously a very large herd, 1,100 cows, uh, very high production, and um, large farm over 1,000 hectares, a shallow loam soil. Uh, about a third of that land is in alfalfa, uh, most of it in corn, about half of it in corn, and then a little bit of wheat, soybean, and grass. Um, the, this farm's manure handling system does include anaerobic digestion with liquid solid separation. Uh, they also incorporate their manure rapidly in the soil and they um, export about 12% of the manure solids off the farm uh, to other users. Now, one of the key factors uh, in these analysis is that um, you have to draw boundaries around a farm and you have to think about inputs and outputs. And I'll, I'll bring up a few times during the discussion some of the choices that were made in this analysis which um, influenced the results. Uh, this is new, near Syracuse, New York, so uh, there was 20 years, 25 years of weather data simulated when we did the simulations to compare different manure management systems. Uh, again, the farm itself has an anaerobic digester, but we do have a lot of data about slurry storages. So one of our cases is to look at a slurry storage system with surface application and also no-till no crop establishment and in no-till systems, uh, manure is typically not incorporated, so that's a surface application of manure. Uh, the second case is looking at liquid solid separation, uh, recycling those solids for bedding. Uh, there are a number of dairies that will do that. Uh, an open storage of manure and rapid incorporation of the stored liquid uh, following surface application, and again with some manure export. And then uh, in case three, the, the manure storage is enclosed and there's a flare used to burn the biogas produced. So as Gustavo indicated, that's a way to convert the methane into CO2, dropping the, um, the global warming impact of, of that gas by a factor of about 20. And then our fourth case is uh, including an anaerobic digester in the system prior to manure separation and storage. And I should mention that there's um, a lot more data about these cases in terms of their overall impacts on phosphorus loading, soil erosion, nitrogen cycling, et cetera. And um, Al Rotz has done that analysis and would be happy to share those details with anyone. We also have some uh, references at the end of the talk. So um, focusing then, though, because of the, the topic of this webinar on the greenhouse gas emissions, um, here's an illustration of those four different options. And uh, just to mention a couple of the important factors here. First of all, the, the blue bars are a, a net of, of the animal and feed impacts. And there's a balance here. The animals are um, emitting methane, as we described, uh, as well as carbon dioxide. Um, the feed is sequestering it. And in this case, um, because of the manure, um, the, the anaerobic digestion doesn't have a blue bar at the base because that manure has been largely digested. There's not as much carbon going on to the landscape and uh, that reduces the carbon emissions in, in that category. So it netted out at zero. Um, the other important factors, the manure is in the, the far left two bars is quite a large con contributor. That's mostly uh, methane uh, escaping from the manure as well as some carbon dioxide. If that methane is flared off, that third bar with the enclosed storage 
um, shows a very small, and in fact, in this scenario, it's the lowest overall greenhouse gas emissions of any of these manure storage handling. But that's because um, the anaerobic digestion uh, scenario, we didn't take a credit for any off-farm uh, reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions by the whatever would have otherwise generated the electricity to, to power that farm. So, um, so in a sense, we, we didn't take the credit that many farmers are selling these days for the renewable energy produce, produced by their anaerobic digester. It, it is worth mentioning, though, that one of the factors that um, gives us a little bit of greenhouse gas emissions in the enclosed storage and also the digester is the fact that uh, methane combustion is typically not complete. And in fact, uh, if you're not careful, the, the pipelines themselves that get to the flares or through the digester to the um, engine generator will have some small leaks. And because of that multiplier effect, even a 1% leak, which was included in both of these examples of methane, uh, turns into, because of that 20 times multiplier, a significant, significant uh, global warming effect. So those are the two factors that make the anaerobic digester a little bit higher, although the, the biggest part of that is the, the unaccounted for credit for renewable energy. The overall carbon footprint, um, previously that was on the farm basis. Here it's, the units are converted to energy corrected milk. For those of you who aren't familiar with those units, uh, that's a way to make uh, dairies that are producing different qualities of milk uh, perhaps on a more even um, footprint or an even playing field uh, so that uh, a high energy milk that has a higher fat content uh, will get some credit for that in terms of the extra value of its milk. Um, again, uh, the, the story is pretty much the same because in this case we were looking at the same kind of dairy and the same kind of milk production from it. That will change, however, in the next case, so I wanted to bring that, those units to your attention. So um, finally, we're going to get into the organic systems. And the, the results here are, are interesting and, and I think you'll find are, are uh, quite provocative, perhaps. But I wanted to introduce you uh, this by saying that these are going to be whole farm results here. Um, and we're going to be setting up a couple of different farming systems in, this, in the simulated scenarios. Um, but I wanted to make sure you're aware that those simulations are informed by four very intensive case studies here in Pennsylvania on four real farms, four or real organic dairy farms um, that are providing the, the data inputs for the in, in organic results that we'll share. Um, they include a 240-acre, 60-cow, mostly grass farm, uh, 45 cows on 185 acres, a uh, mixture of crops and grass, grass, and then two all-grass farms, uh, 100 and 140 cows on 120 and 300 acres, respectively. So the, uh, the production systems that we simulated then are all 100 cows, but they have somewhat different types of cows. Uh, we have an organic grass dairy with 100 small-framed Holstein uh, Jersey cows, mixed, Jersey, mixed Holsteins and Jerseys, uh, maintained outdoors, annual, annual milk production of about 5,600 kilograms per cow at a 4% fat content, with a 100 he hectares of perennial grassland. Uh, the animals fed uh, high forage diets, so they've got a lot of grass to eat, and a spring calving cycle. We also simulated an organic crop farm, uh, again 100 cows, but in this case medium framed Holsteins housed in a freestall barn with replacement heifers in a bedded pack. Annual milk production uh, increased to about 7,900 kilograms per cow and the 3.5% fat content. And the 100 acres again, uh, but broken between 70 hectares of cropland and alfalfa, corn, wheat, and soybean and 30 hectares of perennial grassland rotationally grazed during the growing season. Uh, again, high forage diets here with the manure, since they are housed in the barn for part of the year, stored and spread in the spring and fall. We also have two conventional systems for comparison. Uh, this conventional grazing system is actually not too different from the 
uh, the organic crop system, and you'll see in the figures, uh, and that's because the organic crop system has still got a lot of grass because of uh, requirements for organic production, whereas the, the conventional system uh, has some grass, more than most conventional dairies, but uh, in fact a little bit comparable to that high crop organic dairy. So again, 100 medium framed Holsteins in a freestar barn plus replacement huffers in a bedded pack. Annual milk production a little bit higher, 8,100 kilograms per cow, same fat content of 3.5%. Uh, 60 he hectares in alpha and, alfalfa and corn and 40 hectares in perennial grassland, rotationally grazed and harvested. Again, the high forage diets with manure stored and spread in spring and fall. And then finally, a, a conventional confinement system, 100 large frame Holsteins plus replacement heifers in all in freestall barns, annual milk production of 10,000 kilograms per cow, 100 hectares of cropland and alfalfa and corn. Uh, instead of a high forage, a high concentrate diet, which as you recall reduces methane emissions, um, but has some other impacts because of the, the cropping system requirements. And again, the manure spread stored and spread in the spring and, spring and fall. So this is just to show the, the overall feed use in these systems. Um, you'll note that that organic grass-fed dairy had uh, some additional concentrate purchased, didn't have any, uh, any grain for those cows, and so had some supplemental. Uh, there was also grain production on the, uh, the three farms to the right and uh, graze far forage on the three to the left, and then hay and silage production uh, on each one in different quantities. And here you see the overall tons of dry matter per year for each of those four farms. So again, we have the paired organic on the left and the paired conventional on the right, uh, the fully grass or all grass organic on the far left and the uh, confinement conventional system on the far right. And then the organic crop and the conventional graze are, for the reasons I mentioned, really quite similar, although they might be called, uh, one, one called a crop and one a graze farm because of their distinctions from the rest of their cluster. So um, here are the greenhouse gas emissions in these systems, and these are on a per cow basis. Uh, we'll look at the energy content of milk basis in a moment. Um, and here what you see is the, uh, the organic Organic uh, grass and crop systems have a bit higher uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they're somewhat differently distributed. Um, and, um, and primarily are associated with the animals themselves and their feed system. Um, in the conventional system, uh, somewhat reduced. Uh, some of that has to do with efficiency of animal utilization. Um, in this case, um, Al Rots indicated that there was a compensation made in terms of the number of heifers for uh, those conventional versus the organic systems. And, um, and then finally, that combined conventional system where there is a, a lot more emissions from the manure management system uh, because of the, uh, the uh, emissions associated with that. Here we have those same values on the uh, energy corrected milk. And you'll see that the two organic systems do have somewhat higher carbon emissions here. Um, in fact, almost twice as high as the confined system in the fully grass-based dairy, uh, dairy case. Um, part of that has to do with the high forage diets. Um, part of that has to do with the uh, lower milk production per cow. Um, and again, this is on a, a milk production basis. Now, I want to note that in none of this analysis so far have we considered the carbon sequestration potential. And this is, we'll talk about that next, but this is where some of the grass-based systems really shine. So um, you're all aware that most of our soils have been depleted in carbon through intensive row crop prediction, production for um, many cases well over 100 years. And that conversion of that cropland to perennial grassland can stimul stimulate substantial accumulation of soil carbon for up to 50 years. And so that sequestration turns out to be a major factor in um, compensating for the otherwise somewhat higher uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with some of these grazing intensive systems. So if we take the uh, carbon sequestration per hectare 
and uh, normalize what that potential would be over a 20 to 30 year period uh, during the, the early ramp up of that increased carbon content from switching over to grassland. You'll see that those um, organic systems do perform very well here, especially com compared to the confinement system and, and a very large amount of sequestration from that fully grass-based dairy system. So when we actually uh, use that and normalize that sequestration potential to, to look at the overall carbon footprint on an energy-corrected milk basis, we see that our organic and conventional systems are actually very close to the same. Um, the grass-based system is a bit lower than the crop system on the organic uh, and also on the conventional system, and um, otherwise they're, they're relatively comparable. So it's, a, it's very interesting and important uh, to note that that overall uh, land use system and accounting for sequestration of carbon in the soil uh, makes a huge difference when we look at these dairy systems. So to... Um, start to wrap up here. If we were look at, looking at some of the summary um, take-home points, uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about erosion in the system, but uh, no-till uh, with its erosion losses and soil carbon losses in uh, more intensively tilled systems can uh, create a problem in terms of increased greenhouse gas emissions from systems that heavily use tillage for weed control. Um, there's a lot of work going on now and we're participating in with um, using roller crimpers and other techniques to start to integrate uh, non-till, no-till type mechanisms into organic cropping systems uh, without um, having to use uh, herbicides. Another take-home message that the carbon footprint may be greater in organic production because of lower milk yield and the use of organic fertilizers. And I should have mentioned that a large part of that carbon footprint of those organic systems was because in our analysis here in Pennsylvania, a lot of the dairies are using poultry manure. And that poultry manure has a carbon footprint associated with that. Um, it, as it degrades on the farm, it releases carbon dioxide. And while it does stimulate growth, um, it doesn't over uh, it doesn't stimulate enough growth to overcompensate for that. So uh, systems that don't import poultry and manure um, could actually have a much lower footprint than those that we described. And finally, uh, to reinforce the, uh, the point that during the tra a transition from row crops to perennial grassland, the carbon sequestration associated with that transition can greatly reduce the carbon footprint. So some take-home messages then. Um, in terms of animal nutrition in a dairy system, uh, it's always a good idea to reduce excess nutrients. Uh, we overfeed particularly uh, protein in many cases, and that can increase uh, both, both uh, methane emissions, but also uh, increase the emissions of other uh, gases of concern, such as ammonia. Um, balancing amino acids is a way to to uh, compensate for that excess nutrient insurance that oftentimes dairies have used in the past. Uh, there also are some mixed messages with the increased use of grass forages. Uh, of course, the grass production itself can have a very positive impact in terms of that soil sequestration, but because high forage diets actually do create more enteric methane fermentation and release, uh, that, that is a trade-off there. And then there are some uh, additives that are being explored. Some of these are for reducing ammonia emissions, uh, but oregano is showing some promise, and there are others as well for reducing methane emissions. emissions. So I think there are some interesting uh, plant-based strategies to change that enteric uh, methane emission from the cows. In terms of the housing practices and manure storages, uh, it's a good idea to minimize surface exposure and wind. Uh, where there is anaerobic storage to capture and flare the methane from those storages can have a very significant reduction in, in what would otherwise be a significant potent uh, methane release. Uh, composting, especially, and it's important to, to include enough bedding or bulking material to capture nitrogen, so that's not released. And also to consider anaerobic digestion, particularly with a tight system and getting some carbon credits uh, can, can have a very positive impact in overall greenhouse gas emissions from the farm. And finally, um, using covers to try to capture uh, some of the release gas releases from 
uh, manure storages. Right now, those aren't tuned to deal with greenhouse gases in particular, but one can imagine uh, trapping mechanisms and biofiltration strategies there as well. Uh, methane is a high energy gas, and as it goes through certain biofilters, it can be very rapidly degraded, uh, so it doesn't escape from that material. Uh, finally, in the field application, uh, be, be conscious about weather conditions during manure application. Uh, very stable conditions can be bad for uh, manure uh, emissions, especially uh, the odorous compounds. And uh, inject or incorporate the manure to let the soil filter those emissions, again creating an environment where, where uh, microbes can, uh, can degrade some of the methane and capture some of the nitrogen and other uh, gases and then to use perennials to sequester carbon and to build the soil. So we've uh, listed some references here. Um, I did want to make sure that people refer back to Michelle Cavagelli's uh, initial seminar webinar in this series, uh, which has a lot more great detail on organic grain farming and some of the impacts that can have on climate change. Um, I mentioned Don Storovich's PhD thesis that's available online at Penn State. It has a lot more detail about uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the science behind that in agroecosystems. Uh, Gustavo's work, uh, his master's thesis looking at gas emissions in farm scale production and particularly emphasizing uh, double crops and other system-wide uh, analyses. And finally, the integrated farming system model that, that Al Rotz has led for many years in the most recent um, manual for that in 2009. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Alice and uh, Gustavo and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Tom and Gustavo. We're about to start our question and answer period. And for those of you who missed the very beginning of the presentation, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and then just hit return. If the question box is closed, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question to open it up. We'll be reading the questions out loud and we'll answer as many as we have time for. This webinar will also be posted on the eOrganic website within the coming week in case you'd like to hear it again or if you'd like to share it with others. Um, on that page is also a link to our webinar series schedule of upcoming webinars. And um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to recommend next week's webinar on February 1st by Chuck Benbrook of the Organic Center. Um, he's doing a webinar on the Shades of Green Dairy Farming Calculator. Um, if after the webinar you have additional questions or questions that haven't been answered, you can use the online Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask and you'll get an answer. Finally, we really value your feedback so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey which you'll be receiving in an email later today. So now let's move on to some questions. We have quite a few coming in. Some of them have been answered during the webinar um, but we'll get to ones that haven't. We'll try here. Um, okay, um, we have one question. Um, I think this is for Gustavo about your estimates of emissions based on different uh, hypothetical farms in Pennsylvania. And um, these systems seem to have pretty similar emissions. So um, a listener wanted to know what the error was between them and how really different they are. Is there a specific management? Is the tillage? Um, Which management? See. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it was the second one that you mentioned that this was. You might want to go back and. So I can. Well, guess I was looking. I can kind of just to give a little introduction. So okay. yes, when when the differences are small, they may not be real. Um, that's always a challenge, uh, and particularly with these uh, emissions that are actually extremely hard to measure. Uh, we could have spent a whole other hour talking about measurement techniques and the validation that's gone into these things. So there are error bars that should exist, but we don't even really know what shape they're in. Um, the integrated farming system model has done a, a really you know, good job of trying to build a biophysical model that incorporates all of the science. And um, what we've tried to do in our discussion is indicate uh, the, the science understanding behind what may appear to be relatively small numbers. Okay, and um, this is a question for you, Tom. Um, in your comparisons of actual organic dairy farms, um, why was there a higher use of concentrates in organic systems? 
Well, you know, that's a great question, and, and we had to take uh, some simulations based on the examples that we had. That, that was, in that particular case, that was imported concentrates uh, for a otherwise fully grass-based system. So in the other farms, there, there was a concentrate or, or grain provided to the cows, but it was grown on the farm on cropland. Um, so we recognize that there are many different kinds of uh, feeding strategies that organic dairies use. And um, in fact, you know, it would be very appropriate to look at some very different scenarios than the ones that we've looked at. Um, we were basing these on the, on the practices on the four case study farms that I mentioned uh, organic dairies in Pennsylvania that were looked at in a very comprehensive way. Okay, yeah, we have a couple of questions about the use of poultry manure on these farms. Um, one questioner asked, why use poultry manure if you have cow manure? And another person asked um, about what portion of the CO2 emissions on the grass-based organic farm was due to the poultry manure use. Couldn't this input be replaced with a legume grass mix for forage? And isn't that the norm where farmers do not have access to low-cost poultry manure? Uh, again, very good points. And um, we were doing these case studies based on the Pennsylvania dairies that we worked with. Um, they happened to be, uh, several of them were in the region where there was free uh, or very low cost poultry manure available. And, um, and also it had to do with the balance of, of manure that was produced on the farm with the land area for the farm. So I absolutely agree that, um, and, oh, I, I, and I'm sorry I can't answer the question for what exact proportion of the, uh, the carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions for that, uh, those organic farms were associated with the poultry manure, but I can say it was a very substantial part so I, I'll try to dig that up, and if somebody wants to email me, I can get the exact numbers back to them. Um, sorry, I didn't have them memorized. But, um, but I do think that the suggestion to use uh, legume crops uh, in these systems is a, is a very important alternative and would have very positive impacts, both in terms of uh, reducing that uh, net import of emissions, but also um, creating better soil building strategies than we can oftentimes achieve by moving organic nutrients around the landscape. Okay, here's a question about oregano use. Um, could you expand on the use of oregano in the diet of cattle? I read a summary of Alexander Hristov's research on oregano and was curious if other high tannin forages could reduce methane emissions. Does grazing or feeding harvested oregano have an effect on reduction of methane emissions? That's a great question, and one I'll have to refer to my colleague Alex Erstov, who's not here, but would be, I'm sure, very happy to, to uh, respond to that if you send him an email. it would be very easy to find. Um, I, I do think that the use, uh, first of all, the oregano research, and he did a screening study, which it sounds like this um, listener was aware of, of a, uh, a large number of different plant materials and, and looked at how incorporating them in diets would affect methane emissions. And oregano was extremely promising, uh, had, a, had a very positive impact. But, you know, that was in a somewhat artificial situation. Now, I can imagine you certainly we, we could um, feed oregano and grow it specifically for that purpose. Um, it's right now a relatively high value crop. But I think the, the, the listener's suggestion to actually integrate that, uh, to look at the grazing systems, uh, that that sort of work I don't believe has been done yet, but um, is something that needs to be explored. Okay, um, you'll have to forgive me if I pronounce this word wrong. Do methanogen bacteria in the soil fix methane that is expelled from grazing animals, i.e. capture methane from the manure that the cows apply to the field? This might lower the high calculated methane emission values associated with high forage grazing systems. Great question. And um, first, I will actually work on the pronunciation with you. And it's, okay. it's actually Im important to, uh, to certain biological scientists. So, OK, sorry about so that. The word uh, was probably methanogen. Yep. And methanogens actually generate methane. OK? So um, there are another group of organisms, though, that are called methanotrophs. And methanotrophs eat methane. So there are two different classes of, of organisms that are relevant here. The methanogens live in anaerobic environments, uh, such as anaerobic digesters and the ruminant system of a cow. Um, the methanotrophs live in aerobic environments, 
and they're actually very common in the soil. They're also very common in composting systems, and they will consume methane. So I, I, I mentioned sort of in passing, but the concept of incorporating manure, um, and one of the reasons to do that is because there are these organisms in the soil that will uh, consume that methane as it percolates through the soil, use it for their own energy supply, and convert it into the much less harmful carbon dioxide as they do so. Okay, next question. Um, how were enteric emissions calculated? Did you take into account the quality of the forage in the calculations, or was it just the quantity? Uh, yes, so th it was uh, both quality and quantity. Um, this is uh, based on, a, um, see it's the, I'm trying to remember the exact citation for this, but this is the, the uh, dairy nutrition model that was developed by the National Academies, I think, and, and there's been a lot of input from folks at Cornell on that. Uh, so it's a fairly rigorous biophysical model that includes both quality and quantity characteristics. And so when these forage diets are input, it's not just forage, but it's the specific uh, types of forage that are used for the analysis. Now again, um, as with any model, the, uh, the results are only as good as the uh, inputs, and there probably are some opportunities to fine tune that, but it's a fairly uh, up-to-date piece of science that's embedded in that part of the model. Um, Tom, is any of the data that you covered toward the end of the presentation published? Um, we have a listener who's interested in the combined data about emissions and carbon sequestration impacts in the organic versus conventional. Um, so that's a, a great question, and the answer is some of it. Uh, the, the case studies and the four case study farms that, that I described and then a comparison of those, uh, those simulated four examples of the two conventional and the two organics, was published a few years ago. Um, Al Rotz and Heather Karsten and some others worked on that. Rob Weaver, I think, was involved. Um, that was all done before the integrated farming systems model had the greenhouse gas components in it. So Al re-ran that, that, those simulations uh, recently in the last couple months and uh, just to get the, the uh, comparison for the greenhouse gas emissions. That material that I shared has not yet been published, and uh, Al is working on a publication we were just talking about this afternoon. So um, unfortunately, it isn't available in, in a peer-reviewed format yet, but we hope it will be soon. OK, thank you. Um, let's see, we have time for oh, quite a few more questions, actually. Um, let's see, we had a question about um, deforestation um, by livestock and how that affects um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the comment was that livestock is a small percentage of the greenhouse gas problem unless you count deforestation. What is your opinion of livestock as a cause of deforestation? That's a great question. <laughs> so um, most of you know that the, the uh, biggest concern there is for um, deforestation that's occurring in uh, tropical and semi-tropical regions. Uh, we hear a lot about the Amazon rainforest. Um, but it's, in fact, it's a lot, a lot of it's happening in other types of forest ecosystems, including South America, but also in Africa and parts of Asia. Um, interestingly, the, the, the drivers for that are really quite mixed. Um, I've, I've got a good colleague who's done a lot of work in, in Brazil, and he argues that the, uh, the, the motivation for that deforestation there is actually energy companies. Uh, that, that in order to get into um, untapped areas to extract mineral and oil and gas wealth, um, they're not allowed to do that, to, to deforest for that purpose. So they have a sleight of hand where they encourage uh, peasant farmers to come in with their livestock to deforest the land, and then the um, energy companies come in on their tail. So, you know, to, to work on the causality of that, I think, is sometimes tricky unless you know the um, the political and economic forces within a specific region. But there is no question that a lot of that deforestation is associated with livestock production, that a lot of the livestock production that occurs on recently deforested lands is not very well managed. Uh, and in fact, that creates a sort of ongoing cycle where a lot of that land that is deforested does not turn into very productive land and will cycle back into a much more degraded forest ecosystem over time. So um, 
I guess that's a kind of roundabout answer way of answering the question, but it uh, it is an important factor, and I think livestock and deforestation do need to continue to be addressed um, in a fairly comprehensive manner. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, we have another question related to poultry manure. Um, See, here's another factor to consider. The organic farms may use poultry manure, but that manure is being produced whether the organic farms use it or not. It's not a case where the poultry manure production depends on the organic farm using it, so is there a way to account for that? Another really good question, and I guess I wanted to maybe generalize the question by saying that where one draws one's boundaries around an analysis about greenhouse gases on a farm is really, really important. So this is an example where, for this analysis, the, the boundaries were drawn at the farm fences and gates. And anything that came in or went out from that, um, you know, the, 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 those, what happened to that stuff, it, it would have happened to that otherwise wasn't accounted for. So I think the, the questioner is absolutely correct that that poultry manure um, greenhouse gas emissions could as easily have been otherwise attributed to the poultry farm and by, um, you know, sort of absorbing that greenhouse gas emissions into the dairy farm is essentially giving a giveaway to the, the poultry farm. Um, this is really important, and while we try to be very clear about our assumptions, uh, right now there's, um, you know, a, a lot of debate about where those boundaries should be drawn, uh, what to include in different systems of analysis, and while we still have voluntary efforts to reduce climate global warming gases here in the U.S., um, it, it can be somewhat of an academic question. But as we uh, move towards more uh, rigorous attempts to manage those systems and to uh, economically account for those systems through either carbon taxes or credits or, uh, or pro providing uh, sequestration credits on farms, um, we're going to have to be very clear about those kinds of questions, and this is one example. Okay, we have a couple questions to go back to the beginning of the webinar. Um, you, when you were talking about the causes of greenhouse gas emission, does respiration really matter because it's balanced by plants, i.e. no significant net greenhouse gas emissions? Another really good question. So. Um, because of our decision about using the farm boundary and because uh, inputs and exports um, are important, uh, we, we did like to consider that. Um, that. I think that question might refer to the, the very early uh, mass flow diagram of the overall food system. And you know, I think you can make a fairly good argument that, that agriculture is an ecosystem and that that ecosystem has got some cycles within it and carbon dioxide from respiration from the animal part of the ecosystem that's reabsorbed by the plant part of the ecosystem can be um, you know, a, a compensation that makes sense. On the other hand, um, we know that different types of livestock actually have very different um, efficiencies of conversion of protein and energy conversion into products, uh, whether it's uh, beef or poultry or pork. And so if, if we um, automatically discount or ignore those respiration emissions, we may not get a very complete answer. Of course, the plants are going to soak up carbon dioxide wherever it comes from, but if we work with more efficient animals, uh, we may not have so much carbon dioxide for those plants to soak up. And In fact, those plants could be absorbing other carbon dioxide from industrial sources, etc. So I don't think we should ignore it. Um, I do a lot of work uh, also with biomass energy, and for a long time we used to make a similar claim there that all the biomass we're burning is in fact uh, just recently sequestered carbon that was pulled out of the atmosphere, so we shouldn't really count it. Um, but it turns out that the way you burn biomass actually has a very big impact on how much carbon dioxide you release relative to the, the energy, uh, functional energy that you get out of the system. And if we're going to start giving uh, benefits to more efficient combustion systems, then we have to count, account for the carbon dioxide there as well. So it's a really interesting question. Again, I don't think it's fully resolved uh, in terms of these ecological systems, but for energy systems such as the biomass combustion, internationally now the, uh, the weight of evidence and, and analysis has come down on counting the carbon dioxide, but also counting 
the entire system's uh, ability to sequester some of that carbon dioxide through plants. Okay, we have time for one final question. Um, could you address the potential of biochar to mitigate CO2 from the decomposition of organic matter? Another great question. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, biochar is a charcoal-like substance that can be reduced actually through charcoal manufacturing, but also through uh, various uh, advanced uh, thermochemical biomass energy conversion systems. Uh, pyrolysis is a system where you can take biomass and produce a, an oil that's a, uh, something that can be burned directly in certain stoves or uh, heating units, but also can be further refined into a transportation fuel. And part of that pyrolysis process produces a char that can, that's a very organic material and can be combined uh, with soil as a soil amendment. Um, it, it essentially, by its existence, is sequestered carbon. It is very slowly degradable. And when we look at uh, certain of the most productive ecosystems on the planet, including some, um, some man-made uh, systems in, in Brazil and Latin America, but also our prairies here in America and Ukraine, uh, we learn that a lot of the organic matter in those soils is actually charred material in the natural prairie ecosystems, presumably from many uh, millennia of, of prairie fires. And that material stays there a very long time. So if we're looking for ways to put carbon into the soil um, and keep it there and, and get some of this atmospheric carbon in a, in a sequestered form, um, biochar can be a very positive impact. It, it also has good nutrient holding, water holding capacity. Um, it has a number of other positive benefits in the soil. So again, a great thing to explore and could well be part of uh, low carbon farming systems, not just dairies, but many, many types of farming systems. Okay. Well, we're running out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for your questions. And as I mentioned before, if you have additional questions, you can use the Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask. This webinar will also be posted on the eOrganic website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Thank you so much for coming again today, Tom and Gustavo, and thank you all for joining us. Our pleasure. Thank you all.